mighty presence this morning. Once again, thanking you for the wonderful opportunity that we've had of coming here to be with one another, have fellowship with one another, dear Heavenly Father, and to continue to study those wonderful words that you have laid for us, dear God, through the apostles and through the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your love, the grace, especially the mercy, dear Heavenly Father, that you give to us every day of our lives. We ask that you will bless each and every one of us here this morning as we continue to study those words that you so freely gave to us, dear God, that we may live by them and die by them. So we ask that you may allow us to go on this morning to study, to have that relationship with you through your word. For these things we ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. In verse 6, we talked a little bit about it last Sunday. We ran out of time. But this is what it says. Warning against idleness. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the traditions which he received from us. Separate yourselves from these people. You know, this is a command of God and to the whole church of Thessalonica, to all the churches, to withdraw from any brother who walks disorderly. Now, Timothy had a lot of problems in the church where he was, and also in 1 Corinthians, the, the Corinthian church had a lot of problems in this way. So someone turned to uh, 1 Timothy 6, 3 and 5. Someone read that. 1 Timothy 6, chapter 6, 3 through 5. Okay, like I said, Timothy and the church had a lot of problems there. The people were all puffed up and self-conceited, okay? Uh, actually knowing nothing, empty of the truth of knowledge of God. They were obsessed with disputes, envy, strife, rivalry, evil suspicions, People taught unsound doctrine. The minds were warped. They were the kind of problems that was crippling the church then, and it cripples the church today. That's why the command of God says, stay away from these people that are walking disorderly. Don't associate yourself with them. Because a little bit of that Bad nature will kind of creep on into you. Stay away from them. Someone read Romans 16 and 17. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. This was happening in Rome also. All right. Someone turn to 1 Corinthians 5:11. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11. Thank you. 
All right. So you see all the problems that these churches had? Okay. And it was a terrible situation. And sometimes many of these people kind of favored them and they went with them, causing all kinds of hovac in the church. So one who does not want to work for the gospel, rather all kinds, that makes all kinds of trouble and everything, walking disorderly, anyone who rebels or rebels against God, against God's word, stay away from them. You can't change their minds. Stay away from them. God tells us to refuse fellowship with such people. But now is that just brethren? That's brethren. And we shouldn't associate with the world when they have that kind of a behavior. But this is the brethren. That's right. Right, exactly. Don't have fellowship. Don't associate with yourself, yourself with them. There's been a lot of churches in Christ throughout the nation, even in Asia, that still have the same problem. These are the people that infiltrate the church, become members of the church, and you later find out that they were never members of the church, but people that were creating problems. The book of John tells us this, or 1 John tells us this. So, we don't have that problem here. We don't have that problem at home or with the friends, acquaintances. For if they do, stay away from them. Well, that's part of the elder's job, too. Is to, Excuse me? I think if it was going on in the church and we had elders, that would be up to them to let us know. It would be up to the elders to kind of settle things and put things in order. I've been there for 11 years and it's a thankless job. Now, listen to verse 7 and 8, 7, 8 through 9. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free or charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Verse nine, not because we do not have the authority to make, to make our, ourselves an example, to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. You know, we learn from, from scripture through commands of example. The Christians is not only responsible for his own actions, his own actions before God, but he also is responsible for the effect that he will leave on others who might be affected. Paul says, follow us. For we were not disorderly among you. Follow that example. Even though Paul and his followers were nowhere had the right to ask assistance from the people, even though they might have the right, I should say, but they never accepted anything from them without buying it. They worked, they worked hard, day and night, for money needed to live on in order that they would not be burdened with them. 
Well, they shouldn't be burdened with anyone. What is Paul saying here? Listen, we didn't come in here just so you can take care of us, feed us. We're willing to buy it. If we can't buy it, we'll work for the food. We'll work to spread the gospel. Because that's what we should do. Even though Paul says, I have that authority, but I'm not going to use that authority. He wanted to show them that you have to work, be responsible for yourself, and do what is right with the people. Have you ever been to a house, visited a house where they don't even offer you a drink of water? Or they might, or they might have eat dinner, and you kind of walk in there, and they won't even offer you anything. Ain't <laughs> that kind of embarrassing? You sit down, and you don't know what to do. Has anybody had that experience? I think they have. But... Well, just put yourselves in the apostles' place. They weren't expecting people to give them money or food, but they were gladly buy it or work. It's kind of embarrassing when you go see someone and it's very hot out there, 110 degrees, and they won't even offer you a glass of water. Paul was saying, follow me, follow my example. We're not disorderly. Evidently, there's people in this world that cause all kinds of trouble. Even in the outside world, in, even in the church. More so in the outside world. But to bring it in the church, as it was brought in then, it was a terrible thing. Killed the church. Verse 9, as we read this, this shows the purpose for self-support through labor. It wasn't that they didn't have the right to ask them for food or anything else, but Paul wanted to show them first how one should work for a living. Work for a living. You know, there's people that don't want to work for a living. They depend on the government to support them. I couldn't live that way. And yet there's people that don't want to work, don't want nothing. They want everything to give to them. Paul says, show yourself as hard workers for the gospel. Make a good living. Work. It's amazing that Paul had to remind these people about that situation, the dangers of losing their soul, their salvation, by their behavior, their character. Listen to verse 10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. It's a sin to be an idler. Do you know that? It's a sin not to do nothing. Coming into the church is a sin to do nothing. It's a sin. When Jesus came to this earth, he worked. He worked for you and I. And he died for you and I. And he finished his work, as the scriptures say. Paul had worked 
with his own hands to support himself and others. He was a tent maker. And he was willing to work for anything while he was spreading the gospel. There's no greater tragedy, uh, tragedy in the life of any individual when one sits down to figure out how to make a living without working. It's impossible. A lot of people do it. They rely on somebody else to support them. We don't have that obligation to support those who are lazy. I remember one time years ago, we'd see this gentleman in the church walk right after in the morning before the church service and after the church service. He'd wait outside begging for money. And one of the elders and I came out and uh, I gave him five dollars. <coughs> and the other elder started to laugh. He says, you know, I gave him five dollars yesterday. Following me and the following me and the following me. He keeps on coming. That's how he supports himself. I said, why didn't you tell me that? I only gave him five bucks. He said, I just wanted to see you give him money away. Sometimes you just can't support these people that don't want to live, don't want to work. That's what Paul was talking about. There's all kinds of shysters out there in the world. One time I saw this gentleman in a wheelchair outside Del Taco. Well, they know how they work pretty good. Sitting out there where everybody goes in. So people would cut him by. I heard him once say, Let's buy him some food. So they'd go in there, they'd buy him some food, they'd put it right there in the sun. Others would give him money. He wasn't begging for it. Then after a while, a car comes and he wheels himself into the car and they take off. He was just waiting for the ride. But people were giving him food and food and food and he, he accepted it. They know just where to stop. Well, as I mentioned, we don't have an obligation to support these lazy people. To provide food for them, they should either starve or work. But this is God's command. They're just too lazy, idlers. Now there's people that we can support that can't help themselves and we support them. But you know these shysters. One day I met Colonel Mike McGuire in Las Vegas. He was having a convention out there. He was a veterinarian. And we met up there with them, and I showed him the city because I knew the city well at that particular time. So we went to this mall, and there was this gentleman that was asking for money. So Mike gave him five, ten dollars or so. And I said, you know, these guys are shysters, you know. These guys are just standing, they probably make more money than you, what you make. So as we came out, this guy had a big bankroll of dollars and fifties and twenties or whatever he had, and he was just counting his money. And I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, hey, buddy, can you spare a dollar? Boy, he took off. <laughs> he wasn't going to give me no money. <laughs> See, all, we all started to kind of laugh about it. But that's how people are. Lazy people. Verse 11. Any comments? Verse 11. Robert had a comment there, Dad. Oh, who's that? Yeah, Robert. You know, a lot of times I see those people in the corners begging for money. Uh -huh. But I always got to ask God, if there's anyone that asks for money, do you really need it? Because it's there in my heart. And that's the way I do. Yeah. I still give money. You know what? What's really, what's really sad 
But you see what I'm getting at. You see what Paul was getting at. If you can work, work. If you can't work, you can't work. Listen to verse 11. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner. Not working at all, but are busy bodies. Anyone who does not work will be a busy body meddling with the affairs of others. Since he has no business of his own, he attempts to tend the business to others. A busy body. And when Paul was talking about this, he, you know what he says here? For we hear, for I hear, we hear, Paul's company, I hear, that there are some who walk among you, among the church people, who, are disor who walk in a disorderly manner. Again, stay away from them. Don't support their habits. But these are the people that likes to get into other people's business. That's what hurts the church. Busybodies. Listen to verse 12. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through the Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. All Christians should endeavor to eat, to lead quiet lives, earn their own living, and be quiet. Don't be busybodies. Earn your living as God wants you to do. Live right. Don't be quarrelsome. Don't be disorderly. Naturally, Paul had to talk to these people because that's what was happening in Thessalonica. All kinds of confusion. Confusion as to Jesus was going to come right away. What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to the people that are left and the other people go to heaven? What, what's going to happen to us? Confusion. And some people left their jobs because they thought that Christ was going to come. So why work? We just wait for the wait for the day to come. But we are commanded to be good members of the Lord's body. Not to be meddlers. But good can't have a good living in Christ Jesus. Thirteen. But as far as you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Do not go weary for doing good. While those who did not work did not deserve to eat, and there were still those who were needy due to circumstances beyond their control. 
And so it is to these people that Paul gives the admonition not to worry for doing good things, for living well. Don't worry about that. You're doing great. And if we look at ourselves, I believe we're doing good. We all had good work. We all had jobs, we retired. We give some of our money away to charity, give a lot to the church. We do all kinds of things and God blesses us for it. When the offering comes, we give as much as we can and God will give us more. That's the way it is. But others don't see it that way. Others are disorderly. Now listen. And if 14, if, and if anyone, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. You know, do, people do become ashamed when they start doing something like that and the church stays away from them. They become ashamed. Either they're too proud to come back for repentance or they just stay away. Walking disorderly, not working, not living a good life. What did Jesus say? I come so that you may have life to the fullest. Didn't he say that? To the fullest. And that's what we strive for. Regardless whether we're sick or whatever the case may be, we might have cancer or whatever, we live to the fullest as if though this is our last day of our life. That's what God wants us to do. That's what 14 says. You know, as members of the Lord's body, we often become tired and weary. Many times we're discouraged. And that's kind of normal, the way the world is going. But we should never be discouraged in the church. That world out there is terrible. But when you come into the church, we should never be discouraged but love one another. Remember I told you last week that I can't wait to come on the first day of the week because I'm running out of fuel. Sometimes we get discouraged with the world out there. We're gonna come over here where the brothers are. We'd be encouraged. But that's what the world does to us. You turn on that TV, all you have is negative stuff. So I get tired of seeing it, I'll turn to a Western movie or um, battles that take place in the Second World War, which I love battles that took place. But he says, I wanna go inside. You see too many Western movies, too many battles. But I let her have what she wants to do too. Our blessed Lord always encourages us, always gives us encouragement, doesn't he? All the time. And if anyone will not obey the truth, walk disorderly, as 14 says, you should withdraw from, its, from those fellowships and from him. Have no company with him. Something that they had to do then, 
And when if it ever comes over here, we have to do the same. It is God's command. Verse 15, yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And don't we do that? Don't think of him as an enemy, your brother in Christ. But speak to him as you would speak to a brother who needs to be warned. Paul was almost finishing with his letter. And he wanted all these people to understand the importance of what he had just said. You know, there's a lot of lazy people in the world. And God hates a lazy person. There's a song that goes, you can't go to heaven or you can't go to heaven in a rocking chair because the Lord don't want no lazy ones there. It's true, it's true. You can't be lazy and not work, not spread the gospel, not read the gospel, not live according to the gospel, and expect to get blessings from God. He's already given you a blessing by rain, by the coolness of the day, by the food that you eat. He gives you all that. He gives you life. But we can't give him anything because we're too lazy. We don't want to do that. I want everything for myself. I want people to give me. And I don't want to give out. And Paul finishes with his benediction here in verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace, always in every way. The Lord will be with you all. Can you believe that? He gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding, as Philippians says. We can't even comprehend how he gives us that peace, but it comes down to us. And he helps us. He gives us this, this peace that nobody knows. The world doesn't know the kind of peace that God has to give you. In verse 17, the situation of Paul with, with my own hands, the, the salutation of, of Paul with my own hands, which is a sign of the very, of the very epistle so that I write. The acknowledgement, the address that he gives by his own hand, which is a sign of every epistle that he writes. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. May the mercy, that's what he's talking about, grace is mercy. May the mercy of God be with you all. Be terrible if we didn't have any mercy, huh? But he gives us mercy. Something that we don't deserve. But he gives it to us anyway. So Paul, finishing his letter to the Thessalonians, hoped that he said something to improve the situation there at the church. I'm sure it did. And we should take that to heart as well. Don't associate with those who are walking disorderly. Troublemakers. Busybodies. People that just hurt the church. My wife and I, my family have good experience in that. That's why we left the church in Barstow. Busybodies, war against each other, terrible. Not only there, but everywhere else it happens where churches close their doors. 
fail to exist anymore. Any final comments? Dan. Presence, your comments. And I'm glad I'm here to teach you.